<laughs> and I'll let you say more about your oh, sure. things. So now for something completely different, <laughs> both in terms of topic as well as presentation. Um, as you can see, the title of my talk is Regeneration, the Discovery of Sex Clans in Modern German Culture. Um, before I begin the talk, though, two preparatory remarks. First, I'm going to be showing any number of fairly graphic images of operations on um, animals and humans, and I just want to warn you about that in advance. Second, you should know that I am not a scientist, and I am not going to be able, probably, to answer many of the questions that doubtless will come up about the science of what I'm going to talk about today and what you hear about today. I'm an art historian, um, and my interest in this topic actually began in 1980s while I was doing archival research for an exhibition on the Dadaist Kanakirch, who is generally considered by most art historians today one of the most important photo montage artists of the 20th century. Um, and what I found in her papers were repeated references to, sorry, I'll get this right, to a man named Eugen Steiner. Um, who I'd never heard of and was certainly curious about at the time, but I didn't have time to follow up on it. And it was only in subsequent years when I was researching uh, other artists, writers, and filmmakers at the time that I really became intrigued and started looking into the connections between Steinach and modern German culture. So it turns out that Steinach was perhaps the most famous endocrinologist of his time. Um, and endocrinology, as we know, is the study of, of glands and how they function. And Steinach's specialty was the testes and the ovaries. And it was really he who figured out that the sex glands secrete substances that impact the body. And even before World War I, he published copiously in medical journals. And then, uh, sorry, um, in 1923, he made this film, eponymously titled The Steinach Film, that popularized his research. And it was, this is 1923, it was the first feature length documentary ever. It was 70 minutes in length, it's silent and it alternates film sequences of surgeons operating on the glands with diagrams of the human body and intertitles that tell the viewers what it is that they're supposed to see. The film premiered in Germany's largest movie theater, Bufa's Palast am Zoo, and it was a blockbuster. It was sort of like Harry Potter or Star Wars of its day. Hundreds of thousands of people saw it. It was reviewed in all the major newspapers. Um, what what was presented in it? Um, no. I'm thinking this is not going to work. So, um, among other things, he showed how he transplanted ovaries into castrated male rats and observe the development of female physical characteristics and behavior, and then testes into castrated females and observed the opposite. And so this is what you're seeing here. This is 1923, mind you. This is a blockbuster wow. film like Harry Potter. Um, so what you're seeing here is the transplantation of an ovary into a male. Um, so, based on these experiments, Steinach 
argued that the gonads secrete not just externally, but also internally. Um, and again, these are just film clips. Um, so that these internal secretions were carried via the bloodstream throughout the body and ultimately to the brain. So if the secretions were wholly male or wholly female, that resulted in normal appearance. Um, and if they weren't, so partially male secretions and partially female secretions, but not 100% either, that resulted in abnormal appearance. So this is another film still. Here we see two women whose, in the previous frames of the film, um, whose breasts and nipples had just been measured by a lab technician. Um, with one declared normal and the other one declared masculine. Or here, uh, the man on the left has narrow hips and is described as normal, while the one on the right um, with slightly wider hips is described as feminine. These hormonal secretions were said to have an impact on behavior as well. So those men with more feminine secretions were alleged to enjoy feminine activities such as embroidering, um, while um, <laughs> women with masculine secretions were said to have masculine behaviors. So uh, Steinach was nothing. If but a man of his time, in this case, uh, cigar smoking and book reading. Masculine behaviors. Um, in the last and very graphic sequence of the film, he even suggested that the abnormalities caused by maladept or, uh, or damaged gonads might be cured through corrective surgery. So what he did was he um, removed an undescended testicle from a heterosexual male whose condition was causing him pain, and then he in planted it into the groin of a eunuch who had lost the function of his own testes. Um, he then stitched the outer layer of the skin closed and the testis allegedly healed with its secretion said to be sufficient to affect the de desire change in um, both behavior and appearance in the eunuch. We can talk about this. Now, just in case you missed the Steinock film, which would have been probably impossible unless you had your head in the sand in 1923, the illustrated press of the time was all of us with um, articles about the glands. And just by way of one of many examples, um, Uhu, the, the magazine in which this was published in, Uhu means Yuhu. Um, it was perhaps the most widely read popular magazine at the time, and this is an article by Kurt Tumala, who helped produce the Steinach film, titled The Puzzle of the Glands and Mysterious Effects of the Inner Secretions. Um, it talked about all the glands, but it was really mostly about the testes and the ovaries and the effect they had on the body. So um, given the fact that most of the pioneers, or many of the pioneers of endocrinology, including Steinach, were either German or Austrian, and that the mass media, both print and film, was really way more developed than almost anywhere else in the world at the time. Um, there was, in Germany, much more knowledge about the, the sex glands, right? Um, with gender ambiguity and alternative sexualities, than there was anywhere else. And this, in turn, translated into a visual culture um, that also, more than anywhere else, engages with these topics. And so um, that's what I want to talk about from my perspective as an art historian um, a little bit today. Sometimes there's um, not just a bit, but often lot of anxiety that seeps into the, saturates these images that uh, 
that deal with these issues. This, for example, is a painting by Otto Dix um, of a lesbian journalist, Sylvia Van Harden, who sits at a cafe table. She's drinking a martini um, rather than cradling a baby in her arms. She is smoking a cigarette. Her hands have these enormously long fingers, which were read by contemporaries as talon-like. Um, and in conjunction with her beak-like nose, um, connoted a bird of prey, again, to contemporaries. Um, she wears this kind of shapeless shift that hides whatever curves her body may have had and thus further undermines traditional um, images of, of femininity. She has short hair. She sports a monocle, which at the time was um, actually a well-known sign of, of marker of lesbianism. And though you can't see this so well in reproduction, her teeth are slightly yellowing and even appear to be rotting. Um, all in all, this is definitely not the image of a classically beautiful feminine woman, but one that has a pronounced element of satire to it. Um, Dix has exaggerated her masculine features and makes fun of them. One of the most accomplished painters of the era, one of my favorites, is um, somebody named Christian Schott who also frequently referenced the blurring of gender identity uh, in his work, but instead of caricaturing it, as Dix often did, turned what might be described as a kind of clinician's eye on it. So the count of the title here uh, is in the middle between two figures, the right of which is clothed in this transparent pink gown. Um, he, it is a he, was a well-known transvestite, as it happens, from a very famous bar in Berlin called the El Dorado um, that catered to transvestites. In this particular case, Shah didn't, didn't do what would have been most daring, which was to turn that figure to the front and show him from the front in that transparent rose-colored dress. Um, but at other times, he was very explicit in his images of alternative sexuality. Uh, as, for example, here in this really exquisitely painted image of two women masturbating. And I just might mention um, the size of this. It's really quite large. It's about four and a half feet by three feet, which means it's almost life size. Um, and that certainly made as much of an impact at the time um, as did the carefully detailed genitalia of the woman in the foreground. So this is another take on alternative sexualities, one that is a little bit more poignant perhaps. This is a photo collage by Hirsch that I introduced this talk with. It was made three years after the Steinach film. Um, in the midst of all the media attention to the sex glands. One of her sources to this was an African idol figure that is clearly male because it has a penis. But her cuts it off, you know, she does away with it altogether, inserts a hand coming in from the right side, almost like a surgeon going into the insides of this figure that is clearly imaged as female because of its legs. Um, very likely this was an allusion to sex change operations, which were pioneered, as it happens, by Berlin doctors where he lived um, just after World War I and were also widely publicized in the mass media at the time. Um, so to return to the Steinach film, this is an image that's a little difficult to parse, but um, another component to it is really interesting as well. Steinach had this theory that men could be rejuvenated via vasectomies. And that's what you're seeing here is the spermatic cord being cut. Again, this is 1923 and this blockbuster film. Um, so he maintained in the film 
and in his many scientific publications, that the male body would regain its vigor if men would submit themselves to this minor operation. And first he did this with animals, and so what you're seeing here is a before and after picture. On the top is the old um, rat where the fur is kind of spotty and thin, and the rat looks sleepy, and the text tells us that not at all interested in sex. And then in the after picture, the rat has this full lustrous hair, um, is awake, and the text tells us, in a way, that it has regained sexual vigor. And then um, he does the same thing with men, or so he said. So on the left, there is an aging man. Um, he has bags under his eyes, sagging skin. He's bony versus his rejuvenated counterpart on the right, supposedly, who is um, more alert. He doesn't have any bags under his eyes. He's got tauter skin. Um, Steinach was so successful in convincing the public that his operation was rejuvenating, both sexually and otherwise, that tens of thousands of men um, had it, including, for example, Sigmund Freud. Um, that is to say, some very smart people really believed in this. So another popular method of rejuvenation was practiced by a man named Serge Voronov. Um, who did something slightly different than what Steinach did. Um, he first experimented by transplanting the testicles of young steers into old ones in an attempt to stop the aging process. And the results were encouraging, but um, the challenge, of course, was to derive similar results in humans and, of course, given the relative scarcity of young men, donate testicles for the cause. Um, Voronov experimented with grafting the testicular tissue of young chimpanzees onto aging men. And beginning in 1920, these operations, at least according to Voronov, um, were wildly successful. Already by the mid 1920s, he had performed this procedure on about a thousand pa patients using um, his own monkey farm to keep him supplied with the goods. Um, now, when any given topic becomes the butt of jokes in popular culture, you know that it is really uh, very much on the minds of many. Thomas Taylor Heine was one of the most prominent caricaturists of his day, and in this, um, in this character is Foose, the widespread fascination with rejuvenation through Warnoff's methods in the most widely read satirical journal of the time is called Simplicissimus. Um, front and center is a monkey covering up his testicles, one of which has been removed and is held in forceps by Warnoff at the right. Um, they are about to be implanted into the man on the gurney whose legs we see at bottom right. Um, but the joke is that the, his exceedingly large family standing to the left beseeches the doctor to make the patient prematurely older rather than younger so he would stop procreating. Um, so, you know, what about women? Well, not surprisingly, they were sort of an afterthought for these guys, but they weren't completely left out. Um, there were options for them as well, including something called organotherapy, which involved extracting the juices, as they were called at the time, from the ovaries of various kinds of animals. Um, as one of the premier Berlin doctors who specialized in this described in his book, an illustrated book, and then administering them as infusions into women who wanted to be rejuvenated. Um, another method was um, diathermy, which was uh, a process that involved heating the body, and in particular the ovaries, by means of electrical currents 
that were administered via metal plates attached to electrodes. Um, and it's still used today to repair damaged body tissue, but in the 1920s in Germany, um, it was employed gynecologically, really, to rejuvenate women. Um, Forward a couple. Um, to, yep. uh, oh well. Um, sorry. Didn't quite finish, but um, lots and lots of images, uh, visual culture that engage with this discourse about um, the sex plans and organotherapy, diaphragm, vasectomies rejuvenation, um, alternative sexualities. Thank you.